a lot to discuss. For our top story, there's a global coalition of top energy experts that says 100% renewables is possible. Sounds very exciting. Technology, there's a robot. It's called Huggybot 2.0. It's soft, human-sized, and it hugs users on request. In materials, <clears throat> there is the production of graphene uh, stuff that could be used to really enhance cell phones. And now in space, apparently we're going to get right away three probes to Mars. They're going to reach there in the next two weeks. And these probes are from the United States, from China. And isn't this interesting? The United Arab Emirates. On environment, there are two linked stories. Apparently, millions of lives will be saved annually by 2040 if countries raise their climate ambitions. Interesting. And also that air pollution causes one out of five deaths in 2018. That's more than 8 million. So this kind of thing, uh, maybe it's doable, and if so, can be very promising. And one thing I thought I would never hear, in biology, pigs apparently can be trained to use computer joysticks. <laughs> Um, the what? <laughs> <laughs> and apparently, money isn't all that it's cracked up to be. Apparently, people in societies <clears throat> where they don't have much money can have very high levels of happiness. How happy are you? And now, messenger RNA, we know it's used in COVID vaccines, but it could have a new life in transforming all of medicine. I wonder what that's about. Yes. So, Richard, what's this for our top story about energy experts saying 100% renewables is possible? It's uh, not only possible, but uh, it, uh, I would say, is uh, almost required. And it's part of what is interesting is that uh, they've found that it can be done and it can be done basically cheaper than how we are providing energy in the world today. This is a quote from them. The solution will not only save consumer money, but also create jobs and provide energy and more international security while substantially reducing air pollution and climate damage from energy. That sounds good. And so they are saying transitioning the entire global energy system to 100% renewable by 2035 is imminently achievable. achievable. Uh, and their, their study had 10 points and I'll go through them quickly. The first is that 100% renewable energy uh, worldwide can not only provide electricity, but provide all the energy that's needed on the planet. No more gas. It can also, the conversion to 100% renewable can occur faster than people currently expect. This is what I have seen is the <laughs> rates of change are really fantastic here. And electricity in the new system will cost less than it does now, 
and building the systems, these systems cost less than the current systems, even if you exclude social costs. And the total social cost, which is energy, environment, climate, and health of 100% renewable systems will be dramatically lower than how we operate now. Uh, 100% renewable systems can supply reliably energy 24-7 at low cost. It does mean that we have to redesign the global energy system, of course. Solar and wind will be the key elements along with uh, storage and small scale grid integration. And then electricity will take an increasingly uh, massive share of global energy. And this electrification will result in a super abundance of cheap, clean, renewable energy. And it turns out that coming with it will be investments of trillions of dollars that will provide millions of new jobs and millions more than are lost by uh, the old energy section. And uh, clean, abundant, renewable energy will create wealth and provide a boost for every sector of the global economy. And this rapid transition is necessary to stop the, they say, 7 million lives a year that are currently lost to air pollution. I think they're quibbling about it, whether it's 7 or 8, but they're the same orders of magnitude. So uh, the story is the conversion to 100% renewable energy around the world by 2035 is very doable. And so we should do it. Let's do it. Any comments? Well, I, I don't know. It, it's worth reading the comments that some of the uh, viewers of the Yes. Of the posting had, and there was one there a set by a fellow named Noel Davis that I don't know if you got to them, but he's an aerospace engineer or he identifies himself as one. And he goes through all of the technical reasons that the common dream is exactly that, just a common dream. It's not a possible reality. Well, actually, if you if you think about seven or eight million that die, died by pollution each year, well, in 2020, we had 2.6 million dying worldwide of the virus. So that means air pollution is three times as much, um, and that and we're paying less <coughs> attention than we are to the virus. Yes. Mm -hmm. I was interested in the... We need to get Cleve in here to tell what we need to do to reduce the population. <laughs> Bill Gates was interviewed on uh, CBC News last night, and it ties in with this, what we're talking about today. He says that currently we put up 1550 billion tons of uh, stuff up into the atmosphere uh, and that needs to be reduced to zero, absolute zero. Uh, so um, I'm sure that these guys are working with the same numbers and uh, maybe we are going to be fortunate, maybe when the pandemic's over there's <coughs> going to be a kind of euphoria and people are going to get on board with this and sweep away the dinosaurs and we're trying to hold it back.
Oh, Richard, moving on to technology. And what's this about robots that are soft, human-sized, and hug you on a request? Well, it's the huggy bot too, is what we're talking about here. And, uh, you know, it uh, looks like it'll be good for people living alone. I made the crack though that I want my huggy bot just to know when I need a hug. I don't want to have to ask, you know. But here, I thought you'd be interested in seeing it in the lower right. There is the huggy bot in person or in robot. And uh, the picture on the left is a woman being being hugged by the huggy bot. It took me a while to figure out what was happening in the picture on the left. I uh -huh. was very confused about the <laughs> huggy bot for a while with mm -hmm. the long brown hair. But this is, uh, you know, they are looking for more ways for computers to interact with people. And, uh, this is a, a, maybe a good case for it. The people who developed it uh, were on a research project together a few years ago when they came upon this idea for one of their master's thesis in robotics. And both of the people on the team had family members who lived far away and they wanted to give them a hugs. So this is, <laughs> this is the origin of this development. And they made their new robotic platform. This is HuggyBot 2 after all. So there was a HuggyBot 1 and it was built according to their six design tenets for hugging robots. <laughs> and the first is that it has to be soft and it has to be warm and they think it has to be human sized. You don't want a huggy bot the size of a dog or the size of an elephant, I guess. And it needs to visually perceive the user, the human, and it needs to adjust its embrace to the size of the human and it needs to reliably release when the human wants to end the hug. <laughs> and they say by following these requirements, HuggyBot 2 gives excellent hugs. Mm -hmm. Now its head is uh, made by a 3D printer and its head includes a computer, a screen that serves as its face, a depth sensing camera, because it has to know how far away the person is to hug it, a speaker and a microcontroller. And the screen shows animated representations of a person's face that you can see it smiling or blinking. I guess there's not an option yet to put in your favorite person's face. I assume that'll be a feature they have coming soon. And overall, participants said that they felt that the robot's embrace, which adapted to their body, this increased their perception of the robot as natural in its movement, intelligent, and friendly just because it gave a good hug. <laughs> Any thoughts? Are they going to market these in porno magazines? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure what their plans are yet. <laughs> maybe, maybe they'll teach you how to dance. Maybe, I don't know. That's <laughs> Dancy Robot. That's Dancy Bot. So, now, what I'm... Oh. Oh, go ahead, please. Uh, this is Vijay Nilekani. Yes, Vijay. Uh, I just wanted to, I just wanted to mention that some years back there was a wonderful film called Her H E R, and it's about a cyber 
a romantic partner that oh yes yes artificial intelligence and uh, the man who is going through a divorce falls in love with it and he can't deal without it it's a wonderful movie and it really explores how humans can get lost in the cyber world you know yes <laughs> i just want to mention what i was going to comment about is uh another story i read recently is that ai systems are getting good <laughs> enough at relating and interacting with human beings that they can <laughs> start to use our preferences in the way that we're wired to manipulate us that's right that was actually the theme of that movie too okay <laughs> and so you know uh you know i think i want my robot just to hug me not to do so psychological change on me but maybe <laughs> i need the change i don't know they could program them to tell you to get lost and things <laughs> like that as well <laughs> Well, like, you know, I think you may be talking about Huggy by three. <laughs> you know, to be honest, Richard, I can't imagine getting much comfort from something that inanimate. Uh huh. Really. But it is uh, go ahead, please. It is animate. It's not inanimate. It's just <laughs> not living. Now, uh, there is a lot of evidence from people in Japan, you know, where they are already using robots to for elder care is that uh, people get emotionally attached to their robots, even though their inanimate is all heck and the robots I've seen there are not soft and warm like the huggy bot. <laughs> I think the thing that would turn this into something that would provide some sort of an emotional um, feeling is uh, if they all get hired by Teleflora or you know one of those delivering flowers things, so that you know you order your flowers and you order the huggy box oh. to go out, and then the person who's receiving it knows that they've been thought of. You know? Okay. <laughs> yeah, okay, that's right. So you send a hug along with a bouquet. What a good idea. Have you ever thought about that's marketing? <laughs> I'm sure with those kind of ideas, it's great. Yeah, that's in fact, after each hug. <laughs> so Richard, we have another graphene story about graphene that's wafer scale. Uh, and it can be do amazing things, apparently, for cell phones. What's this about? So, uh, you know me with my semiconductor background, I'm just, uh, these guys talked about wafer scale, and I already thought that it was a great story without even reading the rest of it. And <laughs> uh, the, there is a, uh, deep interest in graphene is the next generation for uh, computer uh, electronics, for semiconductor electronics. I started writing about that months ago, saying we're going to see soon the transition from what I called 3D semiconductors to 2D semiconductors in their uh, push to continue to make things smaller. And this is uh, an actual enabling technology. What they've done here is, uh, you know, semiconductors are all made on wafers. And being made on wafers, they can be handled with automation. And, you know, they make millions of wafers and making another kind of wafer is no big deal. And uh, what they did to make these wafers work is just putting a coat of graphene over a whole wafer is a very difficult thing. So to maintain its uh, thickness and regularity. So instead they're growing patches of smaller graphene crystal on the wafer and it looks like it's very successful and they already have been able to uh, create and build uh, a device on it and the device they're 
building is a high speed graphene photo detector. And this is going to be needed, they believe, because by 2023, the world will see over 28 billion connected devices. Most of them are connected with this new 5G. And the speed of this really demands new technologies. And this particular development may be a key in this technology. You can make the devices that work and work faster than anything in silicon can and at lower power than anything can. So I believe that this marks the beginning of the transition into 2D semiconductors for the next generation of microelectronics. So as such, it's in my mind, an enormous deal. <laughs> no semiconductor engineers in the audience. <laughs> No. Does this mean that a computer would just be like a sheet of arborite? <laughs> Again, if you have a computer that you can make these chips with, then, for example, uh, your cell phone would be able to have the power that your computer has now, and its battery, instead of having enough energy for one day, maybe has enough energy for four days. Mm. You know, yeah. so you get increased density of circuits so they can put more stuff on a chip and it runs more efficiently. So it uses less power. So it doesn't get as hot and your battery lasts longer. Mm. <laughs> and again, the technical development that we've all lived in for the last 50 years since the 1970s has been driven by the fact that we continue to be able to get more power out of a smaller amount of uh, material. And a library would become. <laughs> rather than a building. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. <laughs> okay, I think that's all. I don't know what it is. All the material stories I say, usually these stories are at the edge of what is happening in technology and as such, they're more for your information than discussion because to discuss it, uh, you know, you really have to know more about it mm -hmm. and stuff at the edge of your knowledge, uh, that doesn't work. Anyway, moving on. Uh, now, next we have Mars. And as it says, Mars and more Mars. And uh, this next uh, week or so is going to be a real big time for what is happening in Mars because, uh, you know, Mars is kind of funny with regard to its position in, with the Earth. And you know, because they're both orbiting around the sun. And it turns out uh, every two years, there is a fairly short time where Mars and Earth are at their closest. And so flying from one place to another is a lot easier then. And it turns out this is one of those times. And so in just a few days, there are three missions to Mars at the same time. And uh, the one of them, the first one on February 9th, this has happened already, is 
the Hope Probe from the United Arab Emirates, who none of us think is a space power. It turns out this was actually a very international affair. The engineering work was a collaboration between American and Emirati engineers. It was flown by a Russian jet to Japan where it was launched by the Japanese Space Service. So international mission headed by the Emiratis. On February 10th, uh, China is got to the Mars and the China mission has an orbiter and a lander. So uh, the uh, US lander will not be so lonely on Mars. <laughs> and then on February 18th, then in two days, NASA's latest rover, Perseverance, is going to be landing. And the sheer amount of video and data that it sends back will definitely make this the most exciting. And because of all the video that's sent back, uh, there'll be more pictures on uh, TV on the internet from this one than any other. And so uh, expect to be hearing lots of news from Mars. Any comments? Uh, a quick comment. I was listening to a science radio talk show recently with NASA scientists. Yes. And they said that the Mars rover that the US is landing, that NASA is landing, has digging capabilities. And it's going to dig into the surface and take samples of the Mar Martian surface and package it for shipment. And in 2026, the next version of the rover is going to have a, a launch module that will pick up these samples, come back to the mothership, and then come back. US. Pretty fantastic. The pretty amazing. Uh, yes. Yeah. So we will actually Russian surface metallurgically and geologically and so on. Mm. Also, one of the so things. going to take in 2026. Yes. One of the things that's going on with this uh, NASA mission is more coordination from the satellite and the rover on the ground, because it turns out the rover would like to know where it's good to rove, and it can only see over the horizon, but the satellite can see over the horizon and working them together uh, gets better results from your rover, which after all has a limited ability in how much it can move each day because it has to charge up its batteries and it has one day's worth of battery charge to drive it around the next day. Yeah, and this rover also has a small helicopter, by the way. It's a oh, mark. yes, uh, that's so cool. <laughs> I was wondering about what do you do as a helicopter engineer to design a helicopter to fly in such a thin atmosphere? Mm -hmm. exactly. I was just thinking about that with the thin atmosphere. It's the same with drones. I mean, you, you know, they, they could load the drones on the spaceship and if, if it worked there, they could... Uh, kind of go all over the planet. <laughs> well, thanks, folks. Let's move on to environment. <clears throat> Two linked stories. One is that we can save millions of lives annually if we raise our climate ambitions. And linked to that one, apparently air pollution causes so many deaths. In 2018, more than 8 million. Richard, tell us about it. I have these together because it seemed like uh, they were uh, different uh, versions of the same story. And so, excuse me while I fiddle with the computer for a moment. OK, fiddling almost done. All right. Uh, so, uh, the first story is they're saying uh, 
fully adapting policies that are consistent with the Paris Agreement in just in just nine countries: Brazil, China, Germany, India, Indonesia, Nigeria, South Africa, the UK, and the US. And just those nine countries end up being half of the world's population and 70% of the world's emissions. Uh, anyway, uh, having policies that are really consistent with Paris, they say will save 6.4 million lives a year. Uh, and then uh, reduce the that are due to better diet. Uh, they say almost two million lives a year to cleaner air, and another two million lives a year due to increased exercise. I don't know how. Oh, I guess it's easier to exercise if the air is not polluted. And so they're saying about 10 million people a year in uh, those countries that are half of the world's population, uh, these many deaths can be reduced if we just had clean air. And the next story says, give some more detail Hello. on that. Hello there. Hi, Mary Ellen? What? Let me just give the next story and then we can comment. The next story says microscopic particles of soot, smoke, and dust, they say, are responsible for about 20% of the global deaths. And this is about 8 million people a year. This is actually double what previous estimates you don't have given. delivery, do you? I mean, if, if I want to do it, I have to go through Grubhub? Oh, yeah, we do have delivery. If you, want. you do? Okay, uh, could, okay. Could you turn your mic off, I please? I haven't figured out how to do Grubhub yet. Oh, gotcha. You can just pull And up. so uh, yeah. often okay. when we discuss it. the dangers <laughs> of fossil fuel, <coughs> then... Uh, the main focus is on CO2 and climate change, and we overlook the potential nice health impact of it. And it's important to have this as a part of the picture. Also, from what I've seen, uh, the various cost benefit analyses that have been done, uh, these global deaths are not figured into any of it that I have seen. And one of the reasons why is that it's hard to quantify what is the value of a human life, really. I mean, to somebody besides that human. Uh, and so this stuff doesn't get in the numbers and is so because of that, the benefits of these changes are often understated rather than overstated. Any comments? Uh, during the year we have had, 2020, where we've had so much uh, COVID-19 death, a, a lot of cities in the world have gotten much, much cleaner air. Yes. As a mm -hmm. secondary result which is very interesting. So I assume some lives have been saved just because those cities got cleaner air because of the virus. Yes. One of the things that's interesting, I think in uh, China, there was some period, I don't remember what happened, but uh, the air got clean in Beijing for a while and they were able to evaluate the lower actual costs of the health care during this period and the health care costs turned out to drop dramatically when people can breathe. Mm -hmm. That was during the 2008 Olympics. 
when they uh, shut down their coal-fired plants and ran diesel generators to okay. reduce the air pollution. Okay. Mm -hmm. Richard, I, I, it's very commendable that uh, they could save so many lives. But then the, the uh, other way of looking at it is just that all these people are still going to live. So the uh, population of the earth is going to increase even greater. <laughs> that's it's, right. You're going to have all of those pesky people around. It seems no, like it, ominous. Ominous. I mean, we won't. Okay, we a need a we that. need a better uh, virus problem then. I guess. <laughs> Maybe the, they can use the COVID nineteen pandemic has uh, reduced a number of weaker people, and will continue to. So it's not just the the reduction in overall population, but uh, the reduction of people who are not so productive. Okay, it's weeding them out, huh, Norman? Yeah. <laughs> okay. It also. Well, that's it also reduces the social security cost. Okay, that's a new way to get the balance and the budget and balance. Martin, you want to ride? Oh. Richard, if we move along to biology, and you want to talk about pigs, pigs that can be trained to use computer joysticks. Is that right? Uh, that certainly is right. And you see my comments here. Uh, you know, I wonder if pigs can play a computer game successfully. What else can they do? And can they start to replace workers working from home? The article <laughs> didn't talk about this. This is just my own wild speculation. And it's, you know, kind of interesting. Pigs. <laughs> Uh, have always been thought of as an animal smarter than uh, many of the rest of it. And this uh, <laughs> seems to prove it. So they have taught pigs to, using, to use a joystick playing a game and that suggests that pigs are cleverer than we thought. And uh, they, uh, the specific experiment, they successfully trained four pigs to manipulate a joystick stick and controller on a computer using their snout. Okay, and uh, basically uh, they had a video game in which there were moving screens and the uh, pig had to move the cursor by moving the joystick uh, with its snout to where it connected with one of the screens that was moving around and then it would make a sound bong and then give them a piece of food and uh, they also made it where to continue to give the pigs a good challenge. Then <laughs> they started with four screens. And if they got good at that, they gave them three screens, then two screen, and then one screen. So they gave them uh, ever increasing challenges. And I don't want to say the experiment was successful, but after 12 weeks, they had to uh, stop the training because two of the pigs got so fat that they couldn't stand long enough for the experiment and they didn't fit anymore inside the uh, container, the test pen. And so, um, you know, it seems to be pretty successful. Uh, they did say, however, that the pigs didn't do as well overall in the game as uh, other tests they had done with different kinds of monkeys like rhesus monkeys. But they are suspicious of the interface. And so the next test, test they're going to do is use a computer screen uh, with a touch screen so they will touch the screen with their snout instead of manipulating that stupid joystick and so 
um, there may be a pig in your future. <laughs> Any comment? <laughs> well, pigs are supposed to be smart, but they weren't smart enough to cut down their eating so that they were they <laughs> no. <wouldn't> stand up. <laughs> No, I think uh, pigs think more food is better. That's yeah. our image of them anyway. And I'm afraid what this experiment shows is that pigs will be pigs. <laughs> <laughs> I think that we all expect the, this kind of behavior from dogs. And a lot of us have had dogs at some time in our life. And pigs are supposed to be more intelligent than dogs. That's pigs, right. So. Yeah, I'm just waiting to have uh, to find out that the pigs are being used by the insurance companies to review the claims. <laughs> <laughs> so, Richard, uh, moving along, what's this about uh, places where we don't have much money having very high levels of happiness? I thought this was. Uh, very interesting and from multiple points of view. And, uh, you know, it turns out that money doesn't necessarily buy happiness. And what they did now is, uh, you know, presently, especially in the neoliberal uh, view of the world in which everything is based on money and the value of money and exchanging money and things, economic growth is usually prescribed as a sure way of increasing the happiness of low income companies, countries. And it turns out that maybe we need to reevaluate this assumption. Because uh, here they did research uh, doing in depth uh, work with people in poorer societies in uh, Bangladesh and in, in one of the islands in the Indian Ocean. And they found out that. Uh, here they were working with the poorest of communities and they found out that the majority of people in these communities reported remarkably high levels of happiness. And this was uh, uh, comparable to the happiness that's found in these international happiness service surveys in the Scandinavian countries, which are viewed as the happiest in the world. They don't ask these poor people how happy they are because they don't think, how could they be happy? They don't have a bunch of stuff. And so this finding shows that uh, high levels of subjective well-being can be achieved with minimal monetization. And it turns out that uh, as they were studying it, they found that in the less monetized places, people were the happiest. And then when they started to <coughs> Uh, have the cities expand, for example, and have a life that where there is the increasing importance of money, they found that the same social and economic factors that uh, drag people down in the industrialized countries was happening there in a bigger role. And so overall, their findings suggest that monetization especially in its early stages, may actually be de detrimental to happiness. So go put that in your neoliberal pipe and smoke it. Uh -huh. Any thoughts? Yes, this is in the Scandinavian countries, uh, Richard. And one way the state helps people to be happy is they take more than half their salary in taxes. Uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> I'm happy already. 
<laughs> well, I was just I was just thinking, Richard, that uh, in previous years, you know, the, the more money you had, the more you were insulated from uh, threats, uh, you know, uh, starvation, uh, um, etc. And so it was tied. It was tied to their circumstances. In in contrast to others, now if every one was at the same level, I can see that they would not, they would be happier maybe with less money because they didn't need it. They were all, all equal. But uh, I, I think money uh, was seen as a way of protecting yourself and your family, not just, maybe it de 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 deteriorated into a, 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 just a blind drive for money, but I think it started as a way of protecting yourself. Now they in the uh, they asked the people in these uh, poor societies that were happy about their happiness, and they said the reason they kept coming up with is we're happy because we are able to be with our family, and yeah. we're happy because we're able to be in the natural world. <clears throat> mm -hmm. as long as they weren't starving <clears throat> i would say that happen, uh, money buys comfort rather than happiness yeah. uh -huh. if you have money you can more buy a business class airfares and other things that you would probably wouldn't otherwise so your yeah. travel would be more comfortable you you might stay in more uh, upper class hotels where it might be more comfortable but it, that doesn't necessarily translate into happiness right well, i think eventually it becomes comfort but at first it's just you know safety and protection and then the more you get if you're already safe then it leads to comfort i believe that people need enough money to feel secure to yeah. feel secure that, you know and once they've got enough money to be secure it has very little to do with happiness beyond that you know? right right and oh, I well, wonder the, if your mother another... a, a society I wonder if some people get more money than others. And what happens here maybe is that the more you monetize the society, the more you have inequality, which can be a detriment to happiness. That's right. Well, if that, you're yeah. a fisherman village you, and you all share the fish, then you don't have that inequality. Well, right. happiness is... Uh, often expressed as the gap between your expectations and your realities. Mm -hmm. And if you're unhappy, all you need to do is lower your expectations. Now, they had considered this in the study, too. And one of the things that they uh, found was that even in these happy villages that were poor, exposing them to TV and this greater uh, affluence that you see on TV was not appealing to them. Hmm. It, it didn't raise their expectations. It didn't, it didn't raise their expect or whatever. They didn't respond to it as something that was significant. And certainly probably it didn't raise their expectations. And so, you know, whatever. It would be interesting. It would be interesting if they studied the different religions because you would expect the Buddhists to be the happiest because they expect to be miserable. <laughs> <laughs> As uh, someone who's been a uh, Buddhist at least half time for 50 years, I'm not sure that's what I expect. I know that uh, it's being... There's a lot of uh, misery out there that touches everybody's life. Uh, what I get from all of that is uh, just being happy doesn't take a bunch of stuff. It just takes being happy. Well, and doesn't Buddhism uh, encourage you to be uh, satisfied with your realities rather than to want sure. more? Well, uh, or, certainly Bud Buddhism... Yeah talks about the trouble that you have through striving and attachment and how mm -hmm. that uh, interferes with your peace. I, but I Buddhists remember, probably don't make very good consumers. 
<laughs> oh, I know. But the Buddhist uh, economy in Vietnam is doing pretty well. <clears throat> but I, I remember in my 30s, <laughs> uh, I went to my psychiatrist and said I wasn't starving anymore. I had no reason to have problems. And he said, Norman, finances don't make happiness. What you need to do is go into a dirty, filthy ashram if you want to be happy. <laughs> <laughs> so Richard, what's this about the next transformation of medicine could be using more of this messenger RNA uh, RNA rather than just on COVID vaccines for something else. What's that? Now, the thing about this mRNA is it really is new technology and it's not just for vaccines. Uh, the people at Moderna using this new technology 48 hours after the Chinese had released the <laughs> DNA for the COVID virus, then Moderna had a paper design for a vaccine. And that vaccine was actually produced and ready to start testing in six weeks. Mm. So uh, this is drastically different technology and the guys who have spent the last 20 years uh, trying to develop and promote this technology basically are saying you ain't seen nothing yet and <clears throat> so they are saying that this new messenger rna may offer a whole new approach to building drugs and in they think that one of these things will be vaccines against things that we currently do not have vaccines for, like herpes and malaria. And uh, in addition to the vaccines, they also say that they see a future beyond vaccines into things that include cheap genetic fixes for cancer, sickle cell anemia, and maybe even HIV. And so they are saying this uh, mRNA is a powerful new tool in the uh, medical solution kit and uh, it's going to have much broader use before uh, too much longer. Now, of course, the guys who are saying this are guys in very much in that business who created the business. And you could discount them because they're just uh, saying something to increase their own opportunities. But it may be that the reason they've spent the last 20 years in, of their life investigating this stuff is because it's so cool and has so many things that you can do with it. Any thoughts? Well, one of the reasons that the anti-vaccine people resist these vaccines is because the uh, um, mRNA uh, uh, vaccines actually change the DNA in your uh, anti, um, what do you call them, the uh, T cells and in yeah, system. in your immune system. So they say that there's uh, the possibility of uh, unintended consequences or unintended changes in your, in your DNA that could result uh, from this. But I suppose the old vaccines worked in a similar fashion, just not with the uh, laboratory produced uh, MN, MR, M, M, I have trouble RNA. with that too. Now yeah. also, uh, the reason why they are thinking it can be useful against cancer is this same ability to uh, do gene therapy 
that uh, you're talking about there with the uh, like people CRISPR. who are worried about it. Yeah, that uh, here uh, doing gene therapy is a thing they can do now. Now it's fantastically expensive. And this may provide another way to be able to change these systems. Mm -hmm. Other thoughts? Well, I'll, I'm, I'm getting my second shot of an mRNA vaccine to a day after tomorrow. OK. I can give you some first-hand experience next week. <laughs> and what we expect to hear is uh, how crappy it made you feel. Yeah, and if I don't show up, you know there's something amiss. <laughs> and, you know, the reason why the second shot makes you feel sick is the first shot got your immune system ready to work. And so when you get the second shot, your immune system is working great. And that's why you feel sick. Yep. And our doctor said that if you take a leave beforehand, it helps you not to feel that bad. Okay. Okay, a leave is the particular thing. But yeah. first, let's overcome the freezing rain that's forecast for the vaccine day. Ah, <laughs> uh, okay, okay. Well, we're waiting for your story and uh, the look of radiant health coming from you, VJ. Hope so. <laughs> It'll hasten my move, uh, my move to Ahihik. <laughs> okay, good. We need you here. Well, Richard, thanks so much. And thanks to everybody for participating. I just have one You're last thing. Blue. Yes. Can I, can I just say one last thing? Of the, course. Wonders of, the wonders of technology. I yes. couldn't join your group because I'm having company for dinner, but I didn't miss a single word because I cleaned up, I went out, I got dinner, I got the ice off my car, I got back, and you're still here. All and right. I, listened, I heard everything. Good. I heard everything. <laughs> uh, Richard, one, one administrative question. I noticed an email from Lake Chapala Society that they've started having in-person meetings at Lake Chapala Society. Yes. And I was wondering whether you're moving this back to Lake Chapala Society or you're going to continue the Zoom. Uh, I'm going to keep on Zoom longer than they want me to. Fred and I have not talked about this, but I uh, I like doing these on Zoom. And I think I'm going to keep trying to do it that way. And I don't know if I were doing it at Lake Chapala, if we could uh, do some kind of Zoom cast. I think that uh, doing this and making it available on the internet is so much better. Okay, thank you. The being and in person is nice. Uh, we, do, we tend to do the, uh, this program uh, in the cell indoors. And I don't think anything is allowed to be indoors now. Okay. Right. Mm -hmm. That's right, right. And mm -hmm. so, uh, <clears throat> Whatever it is, uh, we need to keep doing it this way. And they're going to have to light a fire under me to get me to go back into <laughs> the sala because this is so much easier for me than uh, going to LCS, which then, you know, I have to drive there, find a parking place, and do all this other stuff. And so going there adds. Uh, uh, more than an hour to the time it takes each session. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay. So once well, again, Richard, there were a lot more people att attending when you were uh, based in the sala. Uh, so this doesn't seem that popular yeah. with a lot of people. Does this belong to you? Pardon? Does this belong to you? Okay. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. See you next week. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Fred. Adios. Thanks, Thank Richard. Thank you. Thank you both. See you, Clive. Thanks. Have a good one. Bye. Take Bye -bye. care. See you. Let's see. Good to see you, Arden. No, we can see you as well. Okay. Well, then it's okay. Bye.